in the Bible. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, the writer tells us that though we live in a world that is governed by time, that time is the frame of reference by which we live, still, the writer points out, that God has placed the thought in our mind. He has placed the hope in our heart. He has placed a longing within our soul that there is something, something more, something beyond our time on this earth, that there is something else beyond the grave, that there is, in fact, an eternity, that there is a heaven. But the problem is that left on our own, left to our own ideas concerning eternity, we are at a loss to grasp the reality of what lies ahead, of what lies beyond the grave. And even more importantly, we do not know how to get to heaven. We don't know how to get to that place of rest, that place of peace, a place where there there is no more sorrow, no more pain, and only joy in the presence of Jesus. In spite of all of our advances in science and in technology, eternity still remains a mystery to us. It's beyond our understanding. We need someone to show us the way to heaven. We need someone who has conquered death, someone who has made a way for us to follow him there. And the fact is that there is only one who has conquered the grave. There is only one, and that is Jesus Christ. And his resurrection from the dead is the proof that through him, our sins have been forgiven so that the door to heaven has been opened for us by him, for those who belong to him. That is why the truth of the resurrection has been attacked so strongly, why it has been attacked so consistently over the years. The enemy of our souls uses human wisdom. He uses the opinions of men and women in an attempt to influence us into thinking that Jesus Christ really did not rise from the grave. And if he can convince us of that lie, then we have no hope. We will be lost forever. Because I live, Jesus said in John 14, 19, you shall live also. Our only hope for eternal life rests in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even though for Three years while he was on this earth, Jesus told everyone that he would die. And then he said in three days he would rise from the grave. But still, no one really believed him, not even his disciples. And so after he was crucified and placed in a tomb, they all ran away and they hid in fear somewhere in the city of Jerusalem. They were not waiting for three days to pass so that they could see Jesus again. They were just trying to avoid being executed the way that their master had been executed. 
But unlike the disciples, the enemies of Jesus, the leaders of the nation of Israel, had the words of Jesus on their minds. They remembered that he said that in three days he would rise from the grave. And so they were concerned. They were concerned that the disciples of Jesus would come to the tomb and they would steal the body away and then they would claim that he had risen. And so they went to the Roman governor, they went to Pontius Pilate, and they asked him for a detail of soldiers to guard that tomb so that no one could gain access to it. And Pilate agreed to their request. And so for almost three days, these soldiers stood guard outside of that tomb. Nothing happened. But then, then something amazing happened. We're told at the beginning of Matthew chapter 28 that a severe earthquake shook that garden tomb. And an angel descended from heaven, an angel of the Lord, and he rolled away the stone from the entrance of that tomb, a, a stone that would have taken at least several men to move. And then this angel sat upon that stone. And it says that his appearance was blinding. It was like lightning, and his garment was glistening like snow. He was white as snow. Well, the guards certainly knew that this was not a local resident. Then all of those battle-hardened Roman soldiers who had faced fierce enemies many times shook violently with fear, and all of them fell to the ground like dead men. They were paralyzed. They were traumatized with fear. They couldn't even move a muscle. They couldn't even look at this messenger from heaven. And meanwhile, as the day was dawning, as it was approaching the first day of the week, early on Sunday morning, some of the women who were followers of Jesus, came to the tomb in order to anoint his body with spices, as was their custom for burial in that culture. But to their surprise, the stone had been rolled away from the entrance of that tomb, and an angel was sitting on that stone, and he said to them, Stop being afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus, who has been crucified, but he is not here. He has risen from the grave, just as he said he would. Come and see the place where he was lying. They had come to anoint a dead body, but there was no body to anoint. But the good news was that Jesus was alive. But why should they have been surprised? Everything had happened, just as he said that it would. But no one took the words of Jesus very seriously. Things haven't changed much today. We are willing to listen to, to everyone, to anyone except for Jesus. So the angel told these women, go quickly and tell his disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead. And those women had the privilege of announcing this good news to them. Same privilege that we have today. But we're told when those women gave that information to the disciples of Jesus, they didn't believe him. They said that their words seemed like foolishness to them. 
not unlike we sometimes experience today. But there was more. Not only was Jesus alive, but they would see him again. Behold, this angel said to those women, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so those women departed quickly from the tomb with fear, we're told, but with great joy. And they left to report these things to the disciples. But while they were leaving the garden, Jesus met them. He was standing right in front of them. He greeted them. And what did they do? We're told that they worshipped him. What else could they do? Well, now we're told in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 28, while those women were on their way to find the disciples, behold, Matthew says, the Roman soldiers who had been responsible to guard that tomb got up from the ground. The angel of the Lord had uh, gone back to heaven. So now, now what were they to do? We're told that some of them came into the city of Jerusalem and they reported all of these things, well, not to Pontius Pilate. No, they reported these things to the chief priests, to the leaders of the nation of Israel. They related all of the incredible things that had just happened to them, all that they had seen, all, all that they had heard. The earthquake, the angel, the stone that had been rolled away from the tomb, the empty tomb, the words of that angel to those women. Something supernatural had taken place. Something that they could not explain. All that they knew for sure was that they had been given the assignment of guarding a tomb with a dead body inside. And now, well, somehow, some way, well, that body was gone. And they were responsible. So now they would pay with their lives. They would pay with their lives for failing to fulfill their assignment. Well, now the leaders of the nation of Israel also knew what happened, didn't they? Now they knew the truth as well. Uh, but unlike those women, they were not rejoicing. Knowing the truth does not always result in belief, does it? Knowing the facts does not always lead to faith. And so the leaders of the nation of Israel did not rethink their decision to murder Jesus. They did not even consider the possibility that maybe, just maybe, they had made a mistake. That maybe Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah after all. Their hearts were so hardened against him, like many people today. And so they would not be persuaded, no matter how compelling the evidence might be, even if that evidence pointed to the fact that Jesus did rise from the dead. They just wouldn't believe. And so, instead of seeking the truth, instead of seeking Jesus, they were trying to figure out a way to fabricate a lie. They were attempting to do damage control in this situation. What were they to do? We're told in verse 12 that they called an official meeting of the council of the Sanhedrin. And when they had assembled together with the other leaders, with the scribes and with the elders of the people, they counseled together, they, they discussed the situation, and they came up with a plan, a three-part plan. The first part of that plan was to bribe the soldiers, the guards, a detail of perhaps 12 Roman soldiers, 
And so we're told they gave them a large sum of money. Our gurian in Greek. They gave them a bag of silver coins, just like they had given money to Judas Iscariot. But we don't know how much money they gave to these soldiers. The next part of that plan. They needed those soldiers to lie about what happened at the tomb. They also needed them to tell the same story. They had to be consistent in their lie. And so in verse 13, they said to them, can't really say what happened there, what really happened there at the tomb, but instead, here is what you are to say. His disciples came to the tomb by night, and they stole him away while we were asleep. And perhaps no one uh, asked the obvious question here. If all of those soldiers were asleep, which is not likely, since they rotated that responsibility of guard duty into four shifts, but if that did happen some way, and they were all asleep, then how would they know who had come? to remove the body of Jesus from the tomb? It's a good question, isn't it? The last part of this plan involved protection for the soldiers. So the leaders of the nation of Israel reassured them that if this story should come to the ears of the governor and you are held accountable for dereliction of duty, at that point, they said, we will step in, we will win him over, Petho in Greek, we will satisfy his anger and persuade him, and we will keep you out of trouble, Amaramnos in Greek, we will relieve your anxiety, we will set you free from harm and from execution. And so, not surprisingly, Soldiers took the money, and they did as they were instructed by the leaders of the nation of Israel. They gave a false account. They preached a false message throughout Jerusalem concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, Matthew adds this observation where he says, This story, this account, was widely spread and circulated among the Jews, and it is still believed. Even to this day, some 30 years after it happened, there were still many people who believed that lie. And like today, there are still many people who believe it. This account is perhaps one of the greatest testimonies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Why did Matthew put this here? Well, because we would expect that the followers of Jesus would testify to the truth of his resurrection. But the enemies of Jesus were working very hard in their attempt to deny it, and so it becomes a strong statement. It becomes a compelling reason to believe the truth. In the end, the testimony of his followers, the testimony of his enemies, it's the same testimony. He has risen from the dead. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is our only hope for eternity. It is our victory, now and forever. Glory to his name. Amen. Listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. 
If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.